the senator from New Jersey, number 24, Bill Bradley. Bill was a Renaissance man in so many ways. He was so out of the mold of the stereotyped athlete. Bill's image was that of a student, obviously an extremely bright fellow to go to Princeton. A different kind of guy. I mean, that's just all you, you can't say any more than that. But a very intelligent, very smart guy. He was a thinker all the time, and that's what uh, made us effective. Outside Robin, yes! A lot of times, people tend to think you've got those 10 years or so to shine, and then your life is essentially over. He's a guy who totally disproved that. Senator, Rhodes Scholar, Hall of Famer. All of these titles are appropriate for Bill Bradley. With his combination of athletic ability and intellect, Bradley first made a name for himself at Princeton University. Princeton, of course, was not known for its national basketball achievements. So when I went to Princeton, the issue was, can somebody who's from a real university where you have to study play against the, the best. So to me, that was what it was all about. Bill was the uh, consummate player, such a disciplined, hard worker, so dedicated to everything he did. He was a terrific passer. He was a terrific shooter. He had amazing numbers. I mean, he was a big time scorer and rebounder. He was not only the leader on the team, but uh, because of his own work ethic, because of his own competitiveness, you didn't want to disappoint Bill. By the time I was a senior, we had a really good team, and uh, we went on and had a great year. But there was a question about whether Bradley, this Ivy League player, was really all that, uh, that people made of him. And of course, the proof was going to be how he did against Michigan in Madison Square Garden. The game against Michigan in the Garden in the Holiday Festival was one of those games that uh, you keep playing over and over in your life. It was a game against uh, Michigan with uh, Cassie Russell and a heck of a team. They looked like a pro team. Well, Bradley and, and Russell were the two primary players, the two star attractions, for, uh, both All-Americans, and they played the same position. So the stage was set, it was Madison Square Garden, and Bill put on one of his really magnificent performances. He literally rebounded the ball, brought it up court, and put it in the basket. Bill Bradley scored 41 points. Princeton is leading in this game with a few minutes to go by 14 points, and Bradley fouls out. Michigan just went on a tear and wins the game. Princeton was the underdog in that game, and for Bradley to score 41 points and almost single-handedly beat Michigan, it was just a tremendous thing. Michigan was then number one, and so I think we showed that we could play against the best in the country. And then we went on and won the NCAA regionals that year against Providence. And they were the favorite. And we went out and we won by 40 points, 109 to 69. It was one of the best games as a team that I ever played in. Bradley ended his college career as the greatest scorer in Princeton history. The fame of the NBA seemed to be the next logical step. But Bradley's interest extended beyond the lore of big money. The Knicks had drafted me number one, but I thought that basketball was over. That last game in Portland in the NCAA consolation game was going to be my last game. Bradley went from Princeton, not to the NBA, where he could have gotten a huge amount of money, but to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar to study for two years. He grew up with the notion that uh, there was more than basketball, there was life after basketball, and he needed to make a contribution to society. Not many, many people would turn down being the first round draft choice of the New York Knicks to, to uh, take a Rhodes Scholarship and to go to Oxford. But uh, Bill always followed his own tune. He never expected to play again, but lo and behold, Oxford built a gym. After 900 years, the school finally built a gym. I mean, it was like fate. So he got the old urge to see what it was like, and he grabs a basketball, and he goes out on the gym floor in Oxford all by himself, and he begins to shoot hoops. He said he envisioned being in Madison Square Garden. 
Ball comes to Bradley, three seconds left, goes down the left side, jump shoots. Good! And, and I realized that I really loved the game. And to not play against the best would have been to deny a part of myself more fundamental than virtually any other part of me. Crystal City is a small town on the banks of the Mississippi River in Missouri, 35 miles south of St. Louis. My father was the small town banker there, and uh, my father always wanted to be a gentleman. My mother always wanted to be a success, and neither one of them wanted me to be a politician. Susie and Warren Bradley made sure their son Bill would be a success in whatever he did, whether it be piano lessons or basketball. Bradley had the tools to thrive in any environment. He talked often about the values that he learned from playing sports. It really started when I was about 14 years old, and I went to a basketball camp and uh, heard Easy Ed McCauley say, you know, if you're not practicing, remember somebody somewhere is practicing. I decided I never wanted to lose because I hadn't put in the effort. And beginning in my freshman year, I would do about three and a half hours every day, and then five and six hours on Saturday and Sunday for nine months a year. Basketball began to make an impression on Bradley's life, but his thirst for knowledge led him to look beyond the world of sports. When I finished high school, I signed the scholarship to go to Duke, and my father said, uh, you know, you ought to you ought to take a trip to Europe. So I said, fine. So I go on this trip, and one of the places we'd gone to was Oxford, and I was totally taken with Oxford. I thought to myself, God, I gotta come back here someday. And I read that there's a scholarship called the Rhodes Scholarship, and that the school that has the most Rhodes Scholars that get you back to Oxford was Princeton. Life is full of two roads that diverge in the woods, and taking one makes all the difference. And one road diverged when I went to Princeton, and the other road was when I came to New York. Bill Bradley coming to New York was probably the biggest, what we would now call a media event that the New York Knickerbockers had up to that point. There was a lot of interest, partly because of Princeton, partly because some people in the media thought I was a white hope, you know, that I was going to be the white Oscar Robertson. They paid him $500,000 for four years, which doesn't seem like much by today's standards, but at the time, the most money ever paid to a rookie in the NBA. Leonard Lewin of the New York Post referred to him as Dollar Bill because of the then huge contract that he had signed. And it appeared the day after that first press conference, and it stuck ever since. Now officially a Nick, Bradley was free to start experiencing New York City and interacting with the people. With the opportunities that New York presented culturally, educationally, and obviously athletically as a Nick, it was a perfect fit for a guy like him. Everything they say about New York as being the financial capital of the world, the media capital of the world, all those things were true, but what I liked were the average guys. What are the things that make you happy? Oh, gosh. <laughs> He's so incisive as a human being. And he's always trying to figure out the human intellect. Well, he was from a small town in Missouri, so to come to New York, have some different experiences, meet different types of people. Yeah, OK, yeah, sure. I think that broadened his horizons, and it really enabled him to come into his own. Bill Bradley is walking over the scorer's table, and Bill Bradley is reporting it to the ball game. Expectations were high, and once Bradley stepped onto the garden floor, he would soon realize this wasn't Princeton. He came out of Oxford, and he joined the Knicks in December. The season was practically half over, and he's thrust right into the role of being the Knicks' savior against guys who have been playing for years. And you got to feel sorry for any rookie that's got to come into this league and uh, play against these great ones. It was clear that he wasn't going to dominate like he did in college. And it took time for people to be patient with him as he evolved as a player. I bet Bill Bradley will make some notes in his notebook tonight. It was clear that I was failing. Whatever the great hope was, it was dashed. And that's when people turned on me. 
As I would go out under the stands, people would spit on me and they'd throw coins on me and people would accost me in the street. And it was a very difficult first year because it was such an utter failure. He didn't always succeed at a pass. He didn't always succeed at getting the rebound. He missed some shots. But you knew if he just could maintain his confidence that he was going to be a good pro. Come on, get back. Hold on to it, Blake. Keep going. The only thing I knew how to do was thinking back to Ed McCauley. If you're not practicing, remember somebody else somewhere is practicing. So I went out and worked. And I came back for the second year. I was still playing guard. I definitely improved, but I was still probably half a step slow, particularly on defense. Bradley's struggles continued into his second season, but as luck would have it, someone from his past held the key to his future success. My break with the Knicks came in January of my second year when Cassie Russell broke his ankle. Who could have known that several years later down the road, Cassie and Bill would, uh, their paths would cross again with the Knicks. And suddenly, I was moved from guard to small forward, and it was a much more natural position. He didn't have to handle the ball as much. He threw picks and then was uh, an option, maybe a third option, of getting the ball and shooting. Bradley for a long jump shot that is good. We ended up having five guys play over 40 minutes a game together for the last part of that season. Bradley's improvement had the Knicks on the right track. With the newly acquired Dave DeBusher, the roster was complete. Although the rival Celtics eliminated them in the playoffs, the Knicks knew they were on to something. Next season couldn't come soon enough. To realize there's something special there in this group that gelled. And when we finished that season, we knew that next year was going to be our year. The key thing when I switched to forward was I understood my role. Even in college and high school, yeah, I was dominant on the teams I played on, but I still knew how the game should be played. He made himself into a player who fit perfectly the system that Red Holzman had brought to the Knicks. I was the guy that hit the open shot when it came. Back outside the Bradley. Hey. I moved without the ball, constant movement. He had a great shot but only took the shot when it was the right shot. He was the consummate team player, and he made his teammates better. He was a thinker all the time, and that's what the, one of the ingredients that made us effective, and we knew how to use his talent. Now on a mission, the Knicks cruise through the 1969-1970 regular season with the league's best record and the NBA title in their crosshairs. From the beginning, I knew that we were working well together. We were having fun. That's the ball game with Bill Bradley, the story. We had a successful season. Everybody coming together, which really solidified our emergence as a championship contender at that point. The Knicks outlasted the Baltimore Bullets in seven games, then beat Milwaukee in five to advance to the NBA Finals against the Los Angeles Lakers. The series was tied at two games apiece in game five, when the Knicks' championship hopes were dealt a serious blow. And Willis is hurt. Willis fell on the ball. He's still in the backcourt. The values that have characterized the team are tested most in extreme crises. Willis very slow to get up. It was that fifth game that I always point to as an example of how things come together, our star is gone. We go into halftime, what are we going to do now? All of the belief in each other, all of the hard work, all of the effort that we put in over the years came together in that locker room at that moment. Outside Bradley, one-hander from 20, yes! They will remember this as the night that Reed sat out most of the way and the Knicks came back. We went out and beat the Lakers in the fifth game. And if there hadn't been a win in the fifth game, there never would have been a seventh game. The Knicks lost game six by 22 points. And with game seven only moments away from starting, Willis Reed's status was still up in the air. What happened next would go down in Knicks history. Here comes Willis. 
It's one of those moments of great individual courage in which an individual puts his career on the line for his teammates. Left side of the lane, outside Reed, jumps from 20. Yes. After that, it was all over. Those acts of courage and skill inspired the crowd, and the rest of us played well as a team. And we won a championship. It was a very sweet moment. It is a special moment unlike any other because you know at that moment you're the best in the world. Three years later, Bill Bradley would experience that special moment again. The Knicks were poised to win their second championship in four years. Up three games to one, Bradley was confident. There was a photo that I took of Bill Bradley jumping on Willis Reed, mainly because Bill told me ahead of time that that was what was going to happen. When they practiced the morning of the game, and they're up three games to one on the Lakers, calls George over and says, when we win it tonight, not if we win it, but when we win it, watch me, because I'm going to do something with Willis at the end. And I'm watching Bradley, and sure enough, Bradley runs over to Willis and jumps on his shoulders. For a guy that wasn't flamboyant like Clyde, for a guy that wasn't silky smooth like Earl the Pearl, that is one of the most enduring images of, of all of Nick basketball. He described the picture to me saying that that photograph showed the energy, the dedication, and the years alone in the gym with all the sweat trying someday to be a champion. If you're part of a championship team in the city of New York, that's your legacy, and it never dies. From Crystal City, Missouri, from Princeton University to Oxford to the New York Knicks, the Senator from New Jersey, number 24, Bill Bradley. I consider myself very lucky to have played in New York. I love the city, I love the place. Uh, I've obviously stayed in the area for my whole life. For 10 years, I played before all of you. And there is a bond between those who play and those who cheer. If you're part of a championship team in the city of New York, that's your legacy, and it never dies. When you're doing well, when you're succeeding, there's no place like being in New York, in the garden, in those years. After 10 memorable years with the New York Knicks, Bill Bradley called it a career in 1977. While many would relax in retirement, Bradley set his sights on making an impact elsewhere. A lot of times people tend to think you've got those 10 years or so to shine, and then that's it. Your life is, is <laughs> essentially over. He's a guy who totally disproved that. When I was in high school, the reason I decided ultimately to go to Princeton was because I wanted to be a diplomat. I um, always felt that public service was going to be a part of my life. And I remember the summer between my junior and senior year, I was in Washington as an intern, and I uh, heard Robert Kennedy speak. And I was tremendously moved, and I thought, yeah, I'm, I want to be a politician. Everybody you know, jokingly said Bill for president when he was an undergraduate, but it really did become clear that that was a path that he was going to follow. In 1978, Bill Bradley's political career began when he became a U.S. senator representing New Jersey. He would go on to serve three terms in office. His political life wasn't much different than his basketball playing. Certainly, he was known for hard work and endless drills, and he had the same approach to being a U.S. senator um, and made a lot of things happen by force of will and hard work. There's an awful lot of people in politics who come prepared to do the work, but there aren't very many who are sort of automatically leaders, and Bill was. 
He always felt that politicians needed to figure out what was good public policy and be willing to push for it. And I think that was his approach to, to politics and still is. By 1996, Bill Bradley's time in the Senate was over. In 2000, he ran for the Democratic presidential nomination, ultimately losing to Al Gore. Never one to just pack up and go home, Bradley continued his many intellectual and cultural pursuits. Today, he is an author and works for an investment firm in New York. For someone who has rubbed elbows with world leaders and world-class athletes, he can just as easily talk to the guy next door. Crystal City was important to him in terms of, of a grounding that you get from growing up in small town middle America. It shaped who he was as politics has shaped him and as basketball shaped who he was as well as the thousands of people who loved watching him as a basketball player. And I'll tell you to this day, having been in politics for a long time, travel all over the country, hundreds, thousands of people have come up to me and recalled some moment from those Nick years that meant something to them. It's not who scores is important, but who wins is, and how they win is the most important of all. Thank you very much. He's really a beautiful person to watch and listen to. He's so smart, he's very cultured, he's just uh, a class person, and I'm proud that he's my friend. I've been lucky I've had good family, great friends, lucky to be at the Garden with the Knicks in those years. Tremendously grateful to the people of New Jersey for selecting me for three terms in the Senate. I love doing what I've had a chance to do.